that incentivize industry to invest more in the skill development programs and initiatives upstream as a very integral part of their own business. Uh, very pleased to introduce our panelists. Uh, we have Mr. Sanjeev Asthana, uh, who's the chairman of the Agricultural Sector Skill Council. He is a recognized leader in food and agriculture with over 25 years of experience. Uh, he's also the founder and managing director of iFarm Venture Advisors and chairman of the National Skills Foundation of India. Welcome, sir. Uh, our next panelist is uh, Kalyan Chakravarti, who is the founding SEVAK and executive director at Pan IIT Alumni Reach for India Foundation. He specializes in revenue models formulation and creation of social enterprises that run like companies, but maximize social profit. He has an MBA in strategy and marketing from the Indian School of Business uh, and is also a graduate from the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. Our next panelist, uh, very pleased to introduce uh, Abhiraj Singh Bhal, uh, who is the founder of Urban Company. Uh, as many of you would uh, know the company as Urban Clap, has been now renamed as Urban Company. Uh, Abhiraj is one of the most dynamic entrepreneurs in the country and is the co-founder of the company, as I said. Uh, he was a consultant with the Boston Consulting Group, advising over ad, advising Fortune 500 companies across India, Germany, and Southeast Asia before he quit to begin his entrepreneurial journey uh, with Urban Clap. He holds a bachelor's in electronics engineering from IIT Kanpur and a master's in business from the IIM Ahmedabad. Uh, the moderator for this session uh, is uh, Seema Bansal, uh, who works with the Boston Consulting Group. Uh, Seema leads BCG's social impact practice in India and is a member of the firm's people and organization and public sector practices. Uh, since joining BCG in 2000, uh, she's worked extensively in financial services, telecommunications, focusing primarily on strategy, operational excellence, culture, and organizational design. Uh, Seema is particularly skilled in uh, early primary and secondary education, food security and nutrition, skill building and governance within government agencies as far as her social impact and public sector fields are concerned. Uh, Seema earned an MBA from the IIM Calcutta and a degree in electronics and communication engineering uh, from Punjab Engineering College Chandigarh. Over to you Seema uh, for the panel. Thank you, Saurabh. Um, that was a very long introduction um, <laughs> for me especially, uh, but thank you for all of that. Um, pleasure to be moderating this panel. Um, I think we have a lovely panel today, um, starting with, um, and you know, I was, I was speaking with the panel earlier, you know, across the value chain of the skilling ecosystem. So we have Kalyan who, you know, um, uh, is, is running an organization which delivers a lot of skills to to young people and makes them employable. We have uh, Sanjeev, who's in a way an enabler of this ecosystem, bringing together demand and supply of skilled people. And, and Abhiraj, who's currently running one of the largest companies, um, you know, which provides uh, incomes and livelihoods to, um, you know, to blue collar workers. So it should be an exciting discussion. Um, I think we'll keep the discussion focused both on, on a COVID world and a non-COVID world. So Abhiraj, without any ado, let's start with you. Um, as I understand, uh, you guys currently, Urban Co employs nearly 50,000 people with an ambition to go up to 100,000 people pretty quickly, right? Um, so wanted to understand from you, even you know, in the blue collar segment and in the people that you employ, firstly, what is the importance of skilling, right? How important is skilling from a uh, point of view of customer uh, delivery? And secondly, um, you know, India has had a very vibrant skilling ecosystem for the last 10 or 12 years. You know, NSPC got set up about 12 years ago. We've had this number of 500 million people needing to be skilled. We've had, you know, the ITIs, virtual training, you know, the vocational training providers, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a huge skilling ecosystem. How much are you guys dependent on that skilling ecosystem? How much can you depend and rely on that skilling ecosystem? Vis-a-vis -vis how much investments have you had to make in skilling? Um, at your own end within the organization uh, for what you deliver. Seema, thank you for inviting me uh, on this panel. And it's an absolute pleasure to be talking uh, to everyone. Um, as you rightly mentioned, Urban Company today uh, you know, works with close to 30,000 service professionals. And um, you know, these are uh, sort of quasi employees so they they completely rely upon urban company for their livelihood uh, many of them earn 
a significant uh, premium over what the market wage would be. So if the average market wage for a plumber, carpenter, or beautician would be fifteen to 20,000 a month, the average urban company employee uh, would end up making about 40,000. Um, I think to your question around how important is scaling uh, to the experience for the end user, uh, it's probably one of the most important things. Uh, you know, we operate in the domain of services, uh, ranging from plumbers, carpenters, beauticians, etc., where the value is driven by the inherent skill that the service professional, uh, you know, has, and therefore, the more investments one makes in both the core skill of the professional as well as helping them with tools and mechanization which can make their work easier. Uh, it has a very, very strong and direct correlation with the end user experience. Uh, in our experience, um, you know, I would say that while a lot of the efforts in the last 10 years that, uh, you know, Skill India Mission, uh, NSDC, Ministry of Skill have taken, uh, are, are steps in the right direction. If you compare, um, you know, our skill levels as a country to the global average, we still have a fair distance to go. Um, to give you a sense, you know, the average plumber training program in New York invests $10,000 per plumber and the equivalent for India is about 10,000 rupees. And, you know, some of this is input output and you, you get what you you know, invest. Uh, so urban company has had to, in order to keep the quality high, invest very, very significantly in skilling and training. In fact, I would say it is our most, uh, sort of the one single line item, which is the most, uh, most critical and maximum investment has gone in this domain. Uh, to give you a sense of the scale of this investment, we have more than 100 training centers pan India. Uh, many of these are, are world-class training centers. And whenever we work with SSCs, uh, like the electronics SSC, the beauty SSC, the domestic workers SSC, they, uh, they tell us that, that these are the best training centers they have seen. Uh, we have more than 200 full-time trainers on our payroll. Um, and in any given month, we train and retrain uh, close to 5,000 service professionals. These are a combination of uh, upfront training programs as well as, uh, you know, reskilling programs that we do. And they could be as short as five days to as long as two months. Uh, so, uh, you know, while we would have loved to have relied upon the underlying infrastructure that exists in the country, um, in our experience, there is still a fair distance to go for that infrastructure. Um, and it's a good starting point for us, uh, but but it's it's uh, you know one has to work a lot on top of it. Um, so so overall, I would say that um, you know the skilling infrastructure in the country and and and, and our skilling programs have gotten off to a good start, uh, but there needs to be a, a lot more uh, that we need to do. Good. Thanks, Abhiraj. I think that kind of frames the problem, um, you know, and, and I think what we're trying to solve on this panel fairly well, that how do we actually think about interlinkages and, you know, and use market forces to drive much more efficiency and quality in this ecosystem. So, GP, I'm going to come to you next, uh, you know, as the as as a person who, and, and you look at the agriculture sector skill council, so, so very different from, I guess, the spaces that Abhiraj is talking about. But the challenge remains the same, right? On one hand, we have talked about and we have created a lot of skilling capacity in the country. There's a lot of investment which has happened from the ministry, from you know, from many other players in this space. But on the other hand, there is continues to be this um, you know, narrative that when you employ people, you still need to reskill them. They don't necessarily have the skills which are needed. Our country still doesn't have the skilled manpower. So running this SSC uh, and having a bird's eye view of both sides, you know, people who are skilling for the, you know, for the industry as well as the industry who is employing them. What's your sense of where is the challenge? You know, what is working, what is not working out? And then what is the way forward? You know, because creating a lot of supply in terms of skilling capacity, but then that not being useful in the industry doesn't make sense, right? So we need to solve this problem. Uh, Seema, thank you. So I was listening with a great deal of interest what Abhiraj 
had to say, and I think they're just doing an outstanding job. I think we are all in some form or the other have been uh, sort of big users of uh, what Urban Company does now. Uh, but let me just pick up a couple of points to what Abhiraj mentioned to lay the context of really how the training internationally, you know, what uh, what happens and where India stands really right now. So A, that uh, we've come very late uh, uh, to this entire ecosystem of skill development, you know, just about a decade old now. And the system is still maturing. So, for example, if you go to US or Canada or Germany, for that example, and I'll, I'll relate about Europe. So developed economies, uh, for instance, uh, not only does an electrician may end up paying $10,000. I mean, it could well be subsidized by one of the provinces, uh, you know, what they might do or one of the companies might, government might subsidize. But uh, no electrician worth his name would be allowed in any case by regulation and law if he hasn't got a certification of having done his two or three years of electric, electrician's course. He would not be allowed to touch, uh, get into any home, even touch it by law. Uh, for example, a car mechanic. You cannot uh, become a car mechanic without passing a particular certification course, and you cannot get started. Or for that matter, a conditioning uh, guy or a beautician, or a, even uh, in case of England, for example, tree cutter. That uh, you know, tree cutting skills with the kind of saws what they use is highly dangerous. So you're not allowed to do that. Germany, for example, to avail of any uh, loan on uh, you know, for example, farmer is a vocation, and uh, if you want to be called an agriculturist and you want to avail of any state subsidies or loans or support or whatever, there's almost nearly two and three and four years of courses what you go through. So two parts. One is that as India is uh, just starting on this journey, it has taken decades for them to aid fine tuning, you know, the requirements of the rules, uh, what were created, uh, the regulations which have been uh, crafted and, uh, you know, they've been fine tuned and sort of done in a particular way. And uh, finally, that whole ecosystem supporting this entire piece that, uh, you know, what works, what does not work. But clearly, you cannot get on that path that uh, so even right from high school itself, uh, you know, people would be put on two tracks. The ones who are bright and good would probably go to the universities, but ones who are equally bright and equally good, but may not have active uh, interest in studies would go to the vocational path. So, you know, car mechanic or insurance agent or whatever. But the fact remains that the developed world in terms of the regulations, what they put in have done it way, way before. Now the challenge at India at a very policy level and uh, also at the operating level, they're twofold. One is that uh, we have learned this entire thing that uh, of, you know, the skills are typically uh, learned on the job. So a young boy might join a mechanic and start repairing a scooter and gradually he graduates to from a cleaner to a mechanic to, or, you know, a truck drivers, a cleaner would become a truck driver eventually. But the fact remains that uh, there's no formal education system which has gone into training this person, which leaves two big gaps. You know, one is that, uh, uh, you know, the person is not trained in all the facets of, uh, of the training. So, for example, an urban club uh, or urban company uh, air conditioning mechanic coming to your home would know substantial in terms of his behavior, what he dresses, you know, he takes a picture, there's a technology bit. So he's evolved. But, uh, and perhaps he's getting trained, but is he exactly the same as what someone in the US or Canada might be? Perhaps no. So, so there are a range of things which, uh, which happens and urban club uh, uh, companies way ahead on this curve. Uh, but if I can go after vocation, after vocation, after vocation, the fact remains that the self-learning model has not, takes you there, but not necessarily where exactly you might want to go. So that is one big gap, uh, which is clearly there. The second issue which we have right now is related to uh, uh, is related to uh, this whole issue of how this entire thing worked out by uh, uh, you know when we look at the system of the regulations. Mm -hmm. Now, government today cannot uh, afford to really put regulations around uh, the two pieces that uh, you know we will not allow anyone to touch an air conditioner till he's gone to a two-year course at ITI and done that. So, I mean, clearly that's a problem. We have pretty rapidly on that front. And I think uh, sooner than later, uh, from the, you know, sector skill council perspective, aligning the skills of what they acquire in India in terms of getting international jobs, et cetera, that's happening. The second issue is on infra and the sophistication of the training, what is happening. I think it's a work in, it's a work in progress right now as it is moving forward. So clearly there are uh, some set of issues. 
it is there, how it can move forward. Uh, so how good this training ecosystem is. But the fact remains that uh, depending on where you ought to go. So for example, in agriculture, I'll take a quick example that uh, the technology in agriculture is taking roots and becoming extreme. And uh, for example, the protected cultivation, you know, the use size, uh, digital. Sorry, uh, are we having technology issues with Sanjeev? Hello? Hello. I think his internet is down, Seema. Okay, okay, great. great. Sanjeev, uh, let's just give it 30 seconds. Okay, great. Uh, Kalyan, why don't we move to you and then, uh, and then we'll come back to Sanjeev. Um, so, you know, Kalyan, I think, um, from what I understand, um, you guys are running a very large, uh, you know, skilling operations. Um, and then when we spoke, you mentioned that, you know, you think about quality just as an IIT or an IIM would, right? So I would love to understand, um, you know, how you have thought about the skilling operations. And I think as a part of that, maybe comment on two things, which I personally think are challenges with the skilling ecosystem at this point of time. One is just the duration of skilling, you know, so this whole idea that, you know, someone can go through school, et cetera, et cetera, without necessarily picking up skilling, skilling um, or employability. And then we expect that everything can be taught in three months. You know, so is that idea a relevant one? And secondly, is there perhaps too much funding, free funding in the skilling ecosystem today? So, and it's not market linked, right? So as a training provider, I can get funded by National Skill Development Corporation in terms of getting an easy debt. And as a individual I can get funded to get skilled and hence there is no need for market forces because you know both the cost and the and the revenue side are funded so maybe just talking a little bit about how you thought about those things as as you have gone to market thanks Seema fantastic uh, segue I think um, firstly I want to thank Nudge team for calling me on board and um, you know uh, I completely uh, hear you and I think uh, I'm here to share our experience in that uh, uh, you know, in that uh, context. Uh, so I think the photo is worth a thousand words and we don't have much time. So let me quickly present something more photogenic than me. So I'm going to share my screen on uh, what we are really doing. Okay. Oh, oh. can you enable it? Uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. All right. Yeah, so meanwhile, uh, so let me just uh, explain. So I represent the Pan IIT Alumni Foundation. Um, this is a, a foundation headquartered at IIT Bombay. The fundamental intent was how do we bring the IIT slash IIM kind of spirit into vocational education? I mean, we have a very unique situation that we have some of the world's best infrastructure, I mean, best uh, institutes in the world uh, in form of IITs and IIMs. But when it comes to, uh, um, skill development, we seem to have not the same standards for the ITIs. I mean, I, we never understood why that was the case and we don't believe that should be the case. So what uh, we felt was that uh, we have to bring the IIT and spirit to vocational education and that's why, uh, you know, we felt and this should be also exclusively for the underprivileged. So in some sense, it's IIT meeting uh, uh, Super 30. And we had some elements which I think, like you said uh, rightly, are important. One, this has to be market-based. It cannot be a supply-led conversation. That's why we have an assured placement model. We have a, a non-profit joint venture that is basically uh, kind of done with the state to kind of get a very good uh, vocational education architecture. We have a skill loan model. So let me just uh, uh, kind of give you the footprint of what we've done, right? So we've built capacity for about 10,000 people per annum. Uh, in combination of three uh, uh, kinds of courses. One is, of course, a two to three month training, which is what you're saying, is it enough? And I will come to that in a second. Then there is a one to two year trade licensing courses. And this is our spread across Jharkhand, so it's fairly elaborate. The point I think Agraj was making about quality, right? So look at the infrastructure we've got and uh, uh, just the kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, this is actually comparable with uh, uh, anywhere in the world. So for example, the simulator here, 
uh, the birthing simulator that is being used is exactly the same one that Singapore and John Hopkins uses. So fundamentally, we cannot underinvest in skills like what uh, you know was being said and expect uh, you know magic out of it. This is not how it works. Uh, similarly, take our uh, uh, manufacturing, uh, you know, for women kind of uh, initiative. Uh, uh, of course, we start with our standard engineering drawing, but we also have, uh, you know, 3D uh, prototyping and AutoCAD, which in fact, um, our uh, ISM, IIT, ISM, Dhanbad, the director said, we, we ourselves don't have enough of those. So that's the point. We can't take vocational education as a distant second cousin to, uh, uh, to, to uh, make it market-based. We need to invest in it we need to create aspiration for these kids to really you know uh, kind of come to these institutes and that's that's the kind of uh, uh, you know and this is the kind of infrastructure we've been able to build quickly this is our two to three month program like what uh, 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 you know abhinav was saying uh, our plumber technician courses for example are uh, middle east quality most of them actually end up going to middle east so uh, i don't i mean these are the this is the infrastructure that we got from the state but all that i'm saying is that uh, we need to think of this as not a cheap alternative, but an important uh, investable uh, kind of investment heavy kind of uh, approach one. Second is like you mentioned, uh, how do we make it market based where demand supply seem to be paid for that? That's, that's the problem. We need to bring uh, some kind of copay for bringing equity to the candidates. We also need to get companies uh, like Abhiraj is doing to kind of invest in it, co-invest in it, co-curate in it and with sector skills and others who are kind of uh, uh, facilitators in this um, you know so therefore this is actually kind of helping uh, a convergence of sorts to bring the employer the aspirant and a high quality uh, system that kind of brings it together it's not very different from how iits work right iits have had a short placement since inception they have some of the best in class campuses and uh, they're constantly in touch with employers and all the other uh, set of folks. So that I think is the way forward. We need to bring market inside. It cannot be just government led, though we are with government very, very strongly. So Kalyan, how is the program being funded? Uh, you know, how, like, I mean, so I think the one of the beliefs, I think, in the skilling ecosystem is that because, you know, they are low paying jobs at the front end. So hence, the whole system needs to be extremely low cost efficient. And hence, you don't see the kinds of investments in infrastructure technology and time, you know, for training. So how is your setup for 10,000 people actually getting funded and how does it actually make, uh, you know, think about financial viability? And do you think that's scalable? You know, so when you, if, you know, can it be scaled to 100,000 people or, you know, one crore people? Yeah, I see, I think my point is instead of setting scale artificially, we need to go back. See, I'm just uh, dialing back to the screen share. So this infrastructure from, uh, for us costed about four and a half crores, right? If you take the uh, our culinary center, right? This is actually master shift quality, right? So what we've told the government uh, in any state was that let's have a, we understand that you want to produce more people, but we are giving you an economic case as follows. Uh, if you can convert all your OPEX into CAPEX and let us invest in high quality structure and let us worry about OPEX by getting a skill loan model going so that the candidates can afford this, but they can actually, uh, you know, uh, do a hundred percent, uh, uh, you know, kind of a hundred percent kind of a re, uh, copay. Then what happens is that the government per capita outgo is similar, but they would actually would have created fairly high quality facilities. Uh, which then can actually create aspiration and people would be happy to take loans because the employers also know that they will get jobs and stuff like that. So we need to create that virtuous cycle of value creation uh, by, you know, smartly building a skill loan or any other copay models that are there out there in the market. Sanjeev, Sanjeev, good to have you back. Are you there? Sorry, there's a technical <laughs> glitch. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So let me catch you up on the conversation. I think where both Abhiraj and Kalyan are landing is that, you know, to really get high quality skilled workforce, which is employment ready, um, you know, we need uh, investments. We need investments in infrastructure and in technology and trainers and potentially also, uh, you know, the length of the courses themselves have to be examined, especially for certain high skilled courses. Um, and I think Kalyan's view is that, you know, there are market models where this can actually be made to happen through things like skill loans, you know, converting CapEx to OPEX um, and, you know, without too much additional outlay from the government. 
um, having been at the center of trying to create this capacity and this you know impactful capacity what's your view on that so firstly do you agree that much larger investments are required and secondly do you believe that that can be made to happen at scale and when we're talking about scale we're talking about you know tens of millions of people and not just a few thousand uh, so quick quick answer to both the questions one is that uh, and again i'm just kind of uh, pointing out to the global examples that the skill ecosystem globally in general is supported by the governments so the public uh, policy side and the public resources have played a very critical role in terms of both the infra creation or uh, subsidizing even the operating cost in case the infra gets created by the private sector in fact uh, to a great extent that is what has happened uh, internationally in the developed world but uh, there's a tremendous amount of support available to the employers and uh, both the employees to either get trained and retrained and college students getting trained so there's a large part of public support is provided so one uh, basic uh, understanding we must uh, must have that the skill development system will will to a large extent will need the government support uh, to become viable and become uh, uh, become good enough the second issue related to skills is that uh, the large corporates so like for example we just heard uh, you know abhiraj speaking but uh, the large corporates typically tend to build up the training and skilling ecosystem in house because they're not getting enough trained power so they are able to train well and are able to deploy the resources to get the right kind of uh, uh, resource base can this become a market led viable independent business model and uh, can this work very well my uh, sense is that the government will have to support it for some time to come india has very peculiar problems so if you take people away from uh, from what they do right now and want to get them trained they're basically sacrificing some income what they would get to otherwise come so a the government has to you know support them through the or uh, in terms of some sort of uh, financial support the second issue is that uh, at a large scale for millions upon millions of them we do not have the luxury of having long term courses of uh, you know taking them for 6 months in one year so a the uh, job of income uh, i mean the loss of income what they have and uh, the amount of uh, resources required to train them well will be very difficult so india needs to look at very unique and different model that uh, you know short term training because you know this whole sort of function of uh, recognition of prior learning because a lot of them are already fairly advanced on the learning curve and uh, how do we train them well uh what kind of resources are required so we need to keep it uh, limited because then you need to spread over a longer uh, larger set of people uh, so my sense is that the government support will be required infra will be have to be created but we must contextualize it to the indian requirement completely and uh, and and there are dimensions to it that how it is done and i think that part is very critical to understand that we cannot just entirely go to market led model and make it successful in large scale Yeah, yeah. Abhiraj, uh, coming back to you, I'm picking up on what Sanjeev said. You know, one of the specific points that large companies tend to, you know, create their own in-house training infrastructures and and you know invest in that, and hence what uh, the skilling ecosystem is potentially left to skill for is you know the broader mass SME kind of organizations which potentially cannot invest back into the skilling system, and hence it has to be funded by the government, right? Possibly. um do you see a scenario like or what would be the right sets of conditions for an organization like yourselves to work far more equally with the external skilling ecosystem invest in that and support that rather than you know having your own training centers um sorry i'm putting you on the spot but you know what would it take for larger companies to come back into sort of the government's uh, run skilling ecosystem and support that um it's a good question and you know I, we've done a fair amount of uh, of work uh, with uh, several sector skill councils with uh, with nsdc etc um it's a tough one to answer you know the reality is that there's a certain way in which the skilling ecosystem has evolved in its first 10 to 12 years and uh, there are both goods and bads um of 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 the current ecosystem um i think uh, as you rightly said there's 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 no problem of resources and money i think the government has been generous to deploy lots of resources and money but if one was to do a very systematic analysis of if if that's the best use of every dollar that the government has spent and you realize that you know everything is not as hunky dory as it looks on the surface and i think what that has meant is that you know sometimes large uh, 
you know, organizations with the right corporate governance practices might choose to actually stay out of the skilling ecosystem because they realize that, you know, the complexity of working with the ecosystem, the slowness of it, et cetera, et cetera, is, um, uh, you know, might just weigh you down uh, and, and reduce speed to market. And, and so if you're able to create a, you know, market friendly structure on your own, uh, then, you know, it's better to go ahead with that. For example, the average urban company service professional, you know, uh, is able to do 50,000 rupees worth of business for the company of which they keep 40 and they pay us 10. Our average investment into any one professional is about 20 to 25,000. So the payback period for us is two to two and a half months. So that kind of works. Uh, and tomorrow as the company's brand is building up, uh, you know, we have created, we have partnered with lending partners to say, can you give a loan uh, so that the company, uh, you know, that investment can happen from the, the service professional side and it's a one and a half year loan. So they have to pay a small amount every month. Right. I think the point I'm trying to make is I think large corporations have the intent. Um, and in certain, I think all of us, any large corporation that you see would have had some, uh, you know, in some shape or form, they would be working with the government. Like we have an RPL program with NSDC where all urban company uh, skilled professionals are RPL recognized. So some of the easy things we've done, but when you have to really get your hands dirty, say, okay, can we take over a few, uh, you know, uh, skilling academies or can we actually partner deeply to get skilled manpower on board? I think when the rubber hits the road, then there's basically a big difference in both quality as well as, you know, actually on the ground, how the skilling ecosystem works. Um, and, and, uh, Hence, I think it's, you know, large corporates just end up doing their own thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, and I think, you know, I think therein lies, I think that is the core challenge that, you know, that we need to continue to work on. And I think we're continuing to work on it. But how do we bring sort of the larger corporates, you know, which have the ability to invest in skilling, uh, you know, together with the skilling service providers, together with the SSEs to sort of say, you know, we can actually make this work. Because it's very clear from the examples that, you know, skilling can pay for itself eventually to some extent with some subsidy from the government, you know, if, if the whole ecosystem comes together. Um, I'm going to, uh, you know, there was one comment, Sanjeev, that you made, which is about, you know, um, the three month kind of a thing, right? And, and you know, I think one of the things having, because I work a lot more in formal education, both school and higher education, the one thing that I've always wondered about is that why do we let, um, you know, sort of 12 years pass inside schools without necessarily thinking about employability? And then sort of say, now this child has passed out after 12, and let's find now train him for him or her for three months, right? I was Telling Kalyan, my favorite example, I went to a you know girls' school in uh, Ramgarh in uh, in Jharkhand, and all these girls are sitting on the floor in tenth grade and learning tan forty five is equal to one. They're never going to use it. They're never going to use it, right? So we we try and educate our kids in something which is completely unnecessary and outdated for a large variety of them. Let them go through that, and then sort of say, now we only have three months to make them employable because there's opportunity cost. But if we thought about vocationalization, employability of school education and higher education, you know, it might be a different model. Uh, look, you know, the times that we live in, we can't um, escape from talking about COVID, uh, and and I think on the skilling side, you know, that's a that's a huge challenge at this point of time. Uh, in multiple ways, uh, in multiple ways, um, I think the nature of demand going forward is going to look uh, very different. I think where the job opportunities are going to be is might be very different from where people were working earlier. Has implications on skilling, has implications on reskilling, also has implications on demand and supply matching as different parts of the country open up, shut down, people have moved away. Uh, Abhiraj, my my worldview is that we need a you know urban co of everything now going forward because the entire demand and supply you know matching will have. I'm thinking like Amazon of employment, right? That's what you guys need to get to and then work at a very different level. Uh, but just very quick comments on how does the skilling uh, ecosystem need to respond and and you know to the COVID uh, crisis. Um, we have seven eight minutes before we close the panel. So maybe Kalyan, starting with you, then Sanjeev, you, and then finally Abhiraj. You know, just two, three minutes on what is the current situation going to imply for for each of us and for this ecosystem? Yeah. So Siva, just to, uh, uh, just quickly, I want to connect both the segments, right? Uh, the two to three month, I will go out here and you know do some plain talking. I'm going to say it loud that PMKVY should just pay for placement. The training per se for two to three months is never sufficient. Uh, it can actually uh, 
you know it can only be completed if there's an on the job training component so a short placement is not just a way of finding a uh, livelihood for the person concerned but it's also a way of completion of the training they were already dropped out if you, they don't finish at least nine more months on the job you're just not doing any good to anybody so that's straight out there we should just shut down all uh, we will pay 50% for this for that only 100% on placement yeah that's one now let's connect that to the migrant issue right or the jobs for migrants which is probably one of the important even i'm sure uh, in abhi's uh, company lots of them are also folks not necessarily from the local areas our experience yesterday only i had a call with our employment team right uh, actually there are green shoots of demand okay so it's a great time to reorganize our value chain and our supply chains of uh, human capital to actually bring structure to it to bring uh, uh, formalization to it so i actually see covid as an opportunity but it cannot be on a you know one track and i am not for, for a minute saying there should be no subsidy i am completely not saying that at all i am just saying that subsidy should be smart it cannot be for sake of showing lot of action uh, you know in, uh, in we used to have a favorite uh, quote in our uh, iit days lot of uh, distance covered but no displacement so fundamentally lot of action happens but there is no outcome that cannot be the way going forward for subsidy so when it comes to migrants i think we need to reimagine uh, the way we are structuring uh, homes for them yesterday the honorable fm made some uh, uh, some comments on that similarly we need to structure how they are connected physically and i saw some of the questions where they said why can't we use industry premises the problem is there is a geographical disparity in india the labor comes from up bihar jharkhand orissa etc the blue collar level and the jobs are all in the metros which are more in south and west so it's a europe kind of a problem eastern europe versus western europe so we need to definitely have some facilities on the sourcing side which which kind of give them a flavor make them fit to learn on the job and then place them here so that i think has been the conventional view with more focus and empathy for migrants we cannot treat them uh, badly by not paying enough wages uh, and expect them to show up to work i think that's not fair we need to treat them better we need to kind of take care of them and put productivity at the heart of this then eventually it will work out like uh, abhi was saying about the you know business they do etc it will all work out right uh, even construction companies if the cement price is high now right Uh, they will anyway pass it on so why can't they hike salaries to let's say 15000 rupee levels and make it affordable and good for everybody sanjeev uh, thank thanks for kalyan sanjeev your views on I, I, is the sector skill council thinking um, you know is there thinking within the sector skill council about how does covid impact uh, you know what we do uh, so i uh, so good i mean thanks i just want my quick two minutes just to explain exactly what we are talking about so a that uh, sector skill council is working uh, very actively at two levels one is that post covid 19 the requirement of creating uh, seamless uh, integrated institutions into the supply chain so there's a massive push towards uh, building up entrepreneurship especially at uh, you know the near farm level as well as the urban centers which is linking to the agriculture supply chains so we are working closely on that front uh, the second bit is there's a clear cut uh, further distinction that uh, you know there are certain value chains which are more amenable to uh, building up entrepreneurship which in any case today is being done in some form or the other in uh, urban areas but we want to talk about the returning migrants that can they become part of this for example horticulture value chain in dairy uh, for example in areas like honey medicinal plants forestry produce etc there's a lot of work which is happening so we are building up modules we are building up uh, you know the context in terms of how they can sensibly integrate themselves but now not limiting to skilling alone so the people we are looking for and the partners what we are trying to work with uh, the training institutions that would they be able to not just do the training but would also be able to link them and to uh, you know to the financial support uh, to link them to the market build up capacity on managing an institution and an organization and i think that's the whole idea so we our target is that we'd like to build up 100000 entrepreneurs over next uh, one year mm-hmm. and these 100000 in turn if they can create jobs for another five people each you're talking of almost nearly half a million system ecosystem building it up so uh, so we're just moving a step ahead and insisting that the partners who come on board are also able to provide the other elements not just simply do the training and give a certification and off they go so i think that is the need for india right now with the entrepreneurship is concerned and the job creation part is concerned that's really good to hear sanjeev i mean that, i think that's genuinely like i think thinking beyond beyond you know thinking ahead of time in terms of where we need to go very very cool to hear that 
Abhiraj, you would have seen the most direct impact of all of this uh, in the last few months and, and will continue to sort of think about, you know, how do markets get reestablished? How do, uh, you know, people come back to jobs? How does demand actually pick up? Where, are, where is your head on all of this? I think a uh, couple of things, Seema. So one, I, you know, couldn't agree more with Kalyan. Um, you know, I think we must leverage this overall, you know, pandemic to to restructure how subsidies take place in our skilling ecosystem. Right now, 80% goes for the training and only 20% is linked to the job creation. And I think the government should reimagine that. Um, if not reverse it, it should at least think of a 50-50 kind of a structure because that's really going to put the incentives in the right place. Right now, the incentives are somewhat misaligned. Um, I think the second important point is, you know, any sort of major structural change in any market leads to a equilibrium between job seekers and job givers that has established over many years and decades. It sort of shakes that up. Uh, and hence, uh, there's a need for an intervention to actually match make between job seekers and, and job uh, givers quite immediately. Um, and what we have proposed to Niti Aayog is um, something called a national skills registry, uh, where anybody who is a skilled professional across the 40 different sector skill councils and the skills they represent uh, can register uh, in case they're looking for a job and have been displaced or have lost their job. Um, and any job giver and, and you know NSDC and the sector skill councils together have more than 1000 corporate relationships can also register as job givers and they can be a very efficient real time matchmaking. Sometimes very simple things like databases that are available with NSDC and ASSCs are not updated. So this is, in my opinion, an absolute need of the hour uh, and something that should be done uh, with urgency. Oh, absolutely. Um, I guess, you know, that's time. Uh, we have one minute left. Um, I, 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 you know, definitely want to... Seema, you can, actually, you can actually take a little longer. Uh, maybe go up till about 12.40 or so. Is it? Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, so, um, Sanjeev, then coming back to you, um, you know, on just this topic, I mean, this has been a topic, um, you know, exactly what Abhiraj spoke about, which is, um, you know, creating a platform or a skills registry or whatever you want to call it, right, to actually where we actually look at both the supply of skilled people, the labor, the migrant workers, as well as the demand um, of jobs. Right, because the whole thing has been disrupted is something that you know we um, as BCG have also been talked about. We've talked about with foundations. There are foundations willing to fund it. You know, put some money into it. We've talked about it with governments. You know, various state governments, city governments are are keen to actually build out these platforms. What's the best way to get? I mean, firstly, do you think it is needed? And then, what is the best way to get it started? Because I feel like everyone's talking about it, but it's not happening right now. Right. So imagine it's just a platform to completely, you know, uh, you know, in a, in a new way, connect demand and supply. And, and I think the relevance of that is not just for the next two or three months, but for years to come, right? It will just take away market inefficiencies in many different ways. Uh, so, uh, so this is already happening. It's already there. I think in all the sector skill councils, the people who've been trained, I think databases are very much there. Uh, the question is in terms of sensibly organizing them uh, for them to be user friendly and uh, with the corporates can participate as well. So uh, I think that exists with both with the NSDC and the Agriculture Skill Council. The issue is that uh, it's not large enough. So the total number of people trained is just 4 million people with a country with a employment base of, uh, if you were to include uh, you know, farmers and farm workers and the mainstream employment, which is 500 million people, then obviously this is highly inadequate. So it's a work in progress. I think uh, to the question to should it be there, absolutely it ought to be there. The challenge lies is that uh, unless this organization of, you know, where, what certificate one holds and what job one has been trained in, because, uh, you know, in every respective field, there are multiple job roles getting created, the qualification packs, the kind of job we have been trained for. And there's a, then the other element of, you know, training, retraining and reskilling, which is happening. So there could be multiple rounds of certification. So there's a great example in UK where they have a passport. And uh, that passport is uh, tracking the life cycle of the employment uh, for the individual has in terms of various streams, what they get uh, trained in. And uh, that gets captured on the passport. So anyone who wants to look at, and there's an electronic passport, it's not a physical document. 
but uh, basically any employer who wants to look at it, they would know exactly in the last 20 years where all he's got trained, what he's done, jobs, etc. So there are mechanisms which are there. So to a short answer, yes, absolutely, we need to have. Uh, in terms of where we stand, it's uh, highly inadequate in terms of numbers, but where it does. So, for example, in most sector skill councils, you'll go, they'll have the database in terms of who got passed out in what vocation, what certification, etc. Everything is available. I think it should be made more user friendly and uh, has to be done. So beginning has been made. For example, we are setting up a website where every single person who's been trained by the Ag Sector Skill Council, we are bringing on the same platform, all the employers also. And uh, so it's not a job portal per se. But really, the availability of information at one spot to uh, for people to access that who are the trained people and the job employers, et cetera, they get posted. Then they can get in touch with each other to sort of, you know, seek employment or interview or whatever. Uh, so it's available. I just want to add quick one more element to that. And I think the issue is that, uh, uh, you know, these issues require, I mean, this platforms require a lot of resources. It requires a full organization. Uh, and, you know, the central repository have we have very much with the NSDC. And typically in uh, most of the countries uh, globally, if you see examples, this sits at some public uh, institution, typically. So I think the if you ask me one institution which could do a great job of it, it typically would be an SDC uh, that you can become central repository. But how do you bring in the other 100 million people into the same ambit as well? That, you know, whatever training or otherwise have they gone through the certification? I think that's a challenge that does scale uh, the issue. So it's a time-taking process. Uh, it's happening in some form right now as we speak, but uh, I think it has to become more sophisticated, more user-friendly. Technology has to get enabled, et cetera, but it will happen. So, you know, in my question, there has been that, you know, as soon as we make sort of the, the you know, the skills articulation or the skill certification or, you know, a skill score, a critical starting point on that, automatically it starts shrinking because very, very few people have that, right? Like you said, while they, there might be, you know, 300, 400 million workers, uh, the number who actually have, you know, any uh, credible skills verification behind them is, is, is very small, right? So should we actually then sort of say that, look, that also be market-led and that also be sort of, you know, let that build up over a period of time, but let that not be a gateway, you know, for people to actually come onto this platform, right? So that could be one way to think about it. And oftentimes, you know, what we see is in a crisis, right? I mean, if we had to create an Arogya Sedu kind of an app in another world, it would have taken us years and years of, you know, and, and to get people engaged. But like in a crisis, people tend to come on board uh, very, very quickly. And is this the right time to actually, you know, fuel that? Kalyan, your thoughts on this idea, uh, given that you, you know, interact with many, many people on both ends and, and you know, do the job, the matching part of uh, supply and demand. Absolutely. So I... I... Why is the disturbance? But I actually believe that it's a great time to build that on board. Uh, with only one caveat that, uh, you know, we need to understand that there also has to be, uh, you know what, uh, for example, ITC has done in agreed value chains, right? Uh, so they have actually, so what will interest rural migrants, for example, is is also the cost of the gig or the, the, the value that they can get out of the gig. So in some sense, it will become like a op, uh, option list of sorts that I can go to Kerala, I can get 500 rupees. Uh, if I go here, I get 400 rupees. So a, it needs to be information, but it also has to have some value uh, value parameters that are attached to it so that gigs also kind of, uh, so there are two segments to it. One is a static information database. Second, which is more in the urban company domain, uh, is also a bunch of gigs and what are the kind of values that people can get. But I think the one point I would like to make here also is that I think the standardization of skilling and uh, the entire uh, NSQF uh, alignment has honestly not been up to the mark. I mean, um, uh, we probably are nowhere, our level six here and level six in Germany. Uh, level six in Germany must be Sachin Tendulkar and here the BSc pass out will be level six or five or whatever. So I think we need to be very, uh, recalibrate some of this, reimagine some of this, use this uh, COVID as an opportunity in times of crisis and kind of bring together a good uh, labor management system I honestly think uh, uh, even uh, better than NSDC would be somebody like NIC or, you know, somebody who actually is a uh, actor who's IT based, not so much data from the you know ministry, which is involved based because then the employers also tend to worry, are they policing us, etc. So that's, that's the kind of thing which I think should work. 
Well, that was Asima, a complete. Very, very sorry to interrupt here. I yeah. think uh, I was just want to suggest to you that there are a lot of questions from the audiences. Oh, I'm so well. sorry. You know, uh, we got. If you'd uh, like to sort of take some of those questions over the next five minutes or so, maybe a couple of them. Yeah, um, yeah, but, yeah. But, but very quickly any, in the next five minutes. I'm just scrolling through the questions. Do you have any that are sticking out for you? And I'll also then take over after that. Any specific one that you've seen come up multiple times? There's one that has come from Raj Gilda. Uh, the first one on that list, you could just take a look at that and maybe. There we go. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. You know, so uh, Raj, uh, Raj has a question for Abhiraj. Um, can Urban Clap and your worthy competitor, House Joy, be an assessment and certifying agency based on your huge on the ground experience? Um, and I guess that's a question for Abhiraj as well as um, Sanjeev. You know, would you be okay with private sector organizations, you know, taking on the role of uh, assessment and certification? But Abhiraj, first to you. Yeah, I think that question again, you know, assumes that the role of the assessor is needed. And, uh, you know, I, I have a fundamentally different view of how, how the skilling ecosystem should evolve. Um, I think it has to be more market led. Uh, I think the role of the assessor and, and, you know, the more processes we add, it will create more friction uh, in the process, in, in the entire skilling ecosystem. So I think the role of the assessor, in my opinion, has to be done away with. Um, and you have to link any government subsidies, as I mentioned earlier, uh, to um, actual market job creation for these skilled professionals. And there are enough and more mechanisms to determine whether somebody did get a job or not uh, in, a, in a certain period of time after they graduated. Uh, and the jobs market will really decide whether, uh, you know, the person is skilled or not. Um, it shouldn't be a hundred percent. There will always be, you know, some overcapacity. There will always be some capex infrastructure needed, uh, but it can't be 20 So my fundamental view actually is that this whole assessment model, in itself, which has become a very, very large industry now on the side, um, and I'm quite circumspect about the value that it adds, uh, needs to be done away with. Sanjeev, I'm sure you have views on that. I think given the <laughs> You know, given the funding, I think you so, need to have accountability mechanisms. So please. So I'll, uh, yeah. So I think uh, my view is uh, uh, very different. I think we need uh, an assessment and doing away with uh, just make it completely, uh, you know, disorganized or, you know, completely uh, chaotic. Uh, so in India, we have other challenges as well. So I think, uh, you know, the our standards in terms of how the entities which are operating in the space what levels of, uh, you know, governance they follow in terms of the framework which have been put together. I think those are always a challenge. So there's a, there is a requirement for an assessment. And uh, again, I would uh, say that even if you're replicating any of the best standards globally, there is a certification mechanism. So anything that you do, there's a certification, there's a cost to it. Whether it's done online or through the assessment system, it is required. And the question is whether, you know, is it questionable whether more cost is going towards it? I don't think... Uh, we should bother too much about it at this stage. I think uh, that can be very well incorporated into the whole system. But I think integrity of managing the system is extremely important. So I think towards that purpose, assessment is required. And I think we need quality agencies. Now, as usual, typically might happen, some assessment agencies might be good, some may not be as good. Some may be ethical, maybe less ethical. That could well happen. But I think that's the kind of governance, uh, you know, which has to be put in place to manage that better. And I think... Uh, 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 Systems are seized of that. I think it's happening. It's improving. It's a lot better than what it was earlier. So, but we need assessment uh, and assessors. Both. Seema, th 30 seconds. Yeah, 30 seconds. If I may bring both of them together, why not have a duopoly? Why should only SSCs do it? Why can't industry or SSCs? Anybody can do it, you know? So fundamentally, monopoly of any sort is not good. You should give options. You have a CBSC board. You have a state board. You have NIOS. Let everybody certify. And eventually, the market will find value uh, based on the value. If LNT, for example, says somebody is a good plumber, I think that's the last word as far as I'm concerned. So, if the so, same can be said by plumbing sector skill counts. So both can and uh, should coexist. Yeah, so and Kalyan, Shima, I think, that, uh, sorry, sir, please go on. No, so uh, just a quick answer to Kalyan. I think, look, uh, that issue is not whether anyone has a monopoly or otherwise. No, that's not the issue at all. I think the suggestion here is that we need quality uh, assessment agencies Absolutely. and a certain degree of framework of, uh, you know, some institutional architecture has to be there to manage it, to control that. And uh, that's the only point which is being said. So I not for a minute said that, you know, who should do it or who should not do it. We need as many high quality institutions to be doing that. And I think that's very important. Yeah, I'll just add, uh, Seema, I'm not saying that assessments should be done away with. I'm saying assessment agencies should be done away with. <laughs> 
and there's a difference between the two. I think in today's day and age, you know, you have the IIT exams online, you have the CAT exam online. Urban company today is in the pandemic world doing real time assessments and onboarding skilled professionals all in an online fashion. Mm -hmm. So I think the assessment can be taken online. Anyways, it is assessing the skill, which is, in my opinion, should only be 20, 30 or 40 percent component. And the real big component should be whether the person gets a job or not. And so this sort of dual structure is what we need. And the role of the assessment agency needs to be done away with, because you know, in 10 years, if we would have had to build a high quality assessment agency infrastructure, we would have built it. You know, we, we haven't. And, 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 you know, without mincing words, that part of the infrastructure is the most corrupt and the most failed in all our scaling infrastructure. So that needs to be done away with, bring technology, make it transparent, make it seamless. Seema, 100% of our candidates are assessed by employers. That's why we have a short placement model. 100%. Okay, I think, uh, no, yeah, thank you so, so. much, Kalyan. Um, so look, I just want to take 30 seconds and then hand it over to Saurabh. Firstly, thank you. I think thank you to each of the three of you. I think we've had a beautiful, very open discussion. I think we've all come in from very, very different points of view. We've talked about very touchy topics, uh, you know, role of the corporate, you know, should it be market led? What is the nature of subsidy? How much subsidies needed? Assessments, uh, you know, COVID world, etc. Um, all of you have been amazing. Uh, and I genuinely mean that, right? I've been on many panel discussions where, you know, the conversation either doesn't touch the right topics or can go haywire. Uh, but thank you so much. Um, I don't think we necessarily landed on, uh, you know, new solutions that I don't think that was the objective, but I think the objective was to have an open conversation. There's 140 odd people who are listening into this. Hopefully they took away some ideas and thoughts and maybe all of us can have another offline chat about how to take some of these ideas forward. So thank you very much. I genuinely enjoyed this chat. Thank you, Seema. Good questions are a great starting point. So yeah, thanks. Thank, thank you. So thank, much. thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. I think uh, I echo Seema's thoughts here. There was there were so many points in which I wanted to jump into the conversation, uh, hoping that I was one of the panelists and sharing my views there. Uh, you guys were very candid and very to the point. I think it was. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm sure the audience, just like I did had a great time uh, taking away from the entire discussion. Thank you so much, everyone. Abhiraj, Seema, uh, Sanjeev, sir, Kalyan. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody.